Hey guys, this is Chris, and today Wes and I will be doing a series of videos on what is referred to as the EBI, or External Bus Interface System. Now in this first video, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty details of the EBI system itself. We're first going to motivate the need for this system, and how we're going to go about doing so is with some examples regarding I.O. ports. So let's get right to it. So the main thing we need to remind ourselves about I.O. ports before we start getting into our examples is what an I.O. port actually is. Well, as we discussed in a previous video, an I.O. port can be defined in many capacities. But for the purposes of this course and for this video, let's just keep it simple and relate an I.O. port to a collection of physical pins that can either serve as inputs or outputs. Now understanding that, let's get into the first example of this video. So previously in this course, we've utilized the out-of-the-box switch and LED backpack. Now on this backpack, there are dip switches, tactile switches, and LEDs. But for the purposes of this first example, let's just remain in the context of the dip switches. So in this diagram, I've copied the relevant dip switch circuit from the out-of-the-box switch and LED backpack schematic. And I also denote, as we should have previously in the semester, that that dip switch package is hardwired to port A within our microcontroller. Additionally, I've denoted that port A is indeed a subset of our microcontroller because it's a system within the microcontroller. Now, if I were to be a little bit more specific, maybe I could draw another box around the microcontroller for the micropad to denote that the microcontroller is a subset of the micropad, but let's keep it simple for this example. So what's important to note is that when we want to use this dip switch package, we need to make port A serve as an input port. And what I mean by that is we need to make each of the pins from within port A serve as inputs and not outputs. Doing so will allow us to read each of the switch values or each of the voltage values experienced by each individual switch from within this package, which is exactly what we wish to do. Now let's think outside of the context of our specific hardware in this course and let's think a little bit more abstract. And what I mean by that is, let's just imagine that I have a printed circuit board or a PCB with a single ATX Mega 128A1U microcontroller on it. And that microcontroller, within that microcontroller port A, is hardwired to a set of switch circuits such as these. So now I want to pose the question, with that in mind, what if I wanted to connect more than one dip switch package of eight switches to my microcontroller? How would I go about doing such a thing? For example, let's say that I want to connect four such dip switch packages to the microcontroller where one of them is already connected to port A as shown in this diagram. Well, let's see on the following page how we'll go about connecting the other three. So let's assume that I have four sets of 8-bit dip switches that I want to connect to my microcontroller. And let's also assume, as previously established, that one of those sets of dip switches is already connected to port A. So the question is, how do I go about connecting these other three sets of dip switches to my microcontroller? Well, as it may be obvious already in this functional block diagram, what I could probably simply do is connect each of these sets of dip switches to a corresponding port within the microcontroller as long as I have the resources. So let's assume for this example that you do have access to port B, port C, and port D within the microcontroller. And let's show that we're connecting those by just making these connections. And after I make these connections, I know that this topmost set of dip switches corresponds to port A, next corresponds to port B, following to C, and then the last one to port D. So if I wanted to access some subset of switches within this set of dip switches, what I would do in this setup is access port B within my microcontroller. And more specifically, if I wanted to read the voltage values experienced by any of those switches, I would access the register port B underscore N, as we established in a previous video. So the natural question that arises from this setup is, is this a valid and appropriate means to connect a series of dip switches or a series of external entities to my microcontroller? Well, depending on the situation, the simple answer is, if there are enough resources within your microcontroller, where in this case resources is referring to enough ports to connect to however many 
desired external entities you wish to connect your microcontroller to, then this is a valid means or valid approach to connect such a series of external entities. However, in general, you'll see that there is likely to be a more appropriate or more efficient solution to connect such a series of external entities. And that's what we're going to start establishing for the remainder of this video. So let's note one more time that this current setup and this solution is not that scalable. And that is because if I were to want to grow this set of external entities from four set of dip switches to let's say 37 sets of dip switches, nice. I would not have enough ports within my microcontroller to connect each of the set of sets of dip switches to a respective port. So in this case, there is a certain limit which this does not become scalable. So we need a better solution. Now we're not going to still we're still not going to add another system to our XMega yet. But what we can do to make a little bit more of an efficient solution or more a little bit more of a scalable solution is to utilize another component that we should be familiar with. And that component is a tri-state buffer. So let us remind ourselves what a tri-state buffer is. So essentially a tri-state buffer acts as a buffer or a wire where the input of the buffer can additionally be disconnected from the output of the buffer resulting in a high impedance or floating state. Now this connect or disconnect is controlled via a control signal often denoted as C. So let's remind ourselves of the two notations commonly drawn for tri-state buffers. We have an active high tri-state buffer where the control signal is active high and we have an active low tri-state buffer where the control signal is active low. So this truth table here more or less formalizes what I just mentioned and it says that if the control signal C is false then no matter what the input A is the output B will be in a high impedance or floating state. And if control signal C is true, then if the input A is false, the output B will also be false. And if the input A is true, then the output B will also be true. So ultimately the control signal C allows the input to either be connected or disconnected from the output of the buffer. So in the context of our previous examples, we could connect multiple external entities all together via one single bus with a series of tri-state buffers where one tri-state buffer would be for each signal on that bus. So let's go ahead and see how we would do that for the four previous sets of dip switches that we showed before. So in this diagram we see the same four sets of dip switches that we saw previously. But in this example, rather than try to connect each individual 8-bit dip switch package to an individual port within the microcontroller, let's try to connect all four sets of these dip switch packages to a single port within the microcontroller, which for this example, let's say is port A. Now to do such a thing, we are going to use tri-state buffer components. Now instead of drawing eight separate tri-state buffer components, I'm going to abstract away eight of such components into a single chip which I'm going to denote as an 8-bit tri-state buffer. Now in this component that I'm giving is important to note that there is a signal known as the OE or output enable signal which is going to connect to each of the control signals for the tri-state buffers within the chip. So what that means is that whenever a low signal or a true signal in the context of this chip is provided to the OE then whatever is at the input of the tri-state buffer all of the inputs will flow through to the outputs of the tri-state buffer. Ultimately meaning that the inputs are connected to the outputs. Now whenever a high signal or a false signal in the context of the tri-state buffer is provided to OE, then the inputs of that specific tri-state buffer will ultimately be disconnected from the output bus. So what this means is that I can connect each of the four dip switch packages that I have in this diagram together to create one 8-bit output bus. Now in our example, this 8-bit output bus is going to connect to the 8-bit port A. So for example, if I wanted to read from any of the 8 switches within this dip switch package, the first thing that I would want to do is disconnect these first 24 input signals from the output bus by providing a high or false signal in the context of these chips to each of these three tri-state buffers. And then I would want to connect these 8 inputs by providing a low or true signal to output enable for this last tri-state buffer chip. And then I would be able to read from any of the eight switches within this 
dip switch package by accessing the port A underscore in register within my microcontroller. So the last remaining question for this implementation is, where do these four OE signals that we mentioned previously come from to control each of these four tri-state buffer components? Because at the moment, we are utilizing all eight signals provided by port A within our microcontroller. Well, there are actually many ways to go about implementing this as well. But one intuitive way that might make sense to us the most at this moment is we could just utilize a separate port for the control signals. So let's assume that we're doing that for this example. And let's show that in our diagram. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this symbol, place it, and then let's go ahead and assume that we are using port B. Now let's remember that port B, just like port A, has eight signals that can either serve as inputs or outputs. Now in our specific example, we want four of such signals to serve as outputs from the perspective of the microcontroller in order to control or enable or disable each of these respective tri-state buffer components. So I'm going to go ahead and utilize four of such signals. And arbitrarily, I'm going to choose that these signals from within port B are port B pin 0, port B pin 1, port B pin 2, and port B pin 3. And recall that these are active high stemming from port B. And arbitrarily, I'm going to connect port B pin 0. I'm going to call it OE1 to the first tri-state buffer, this topmost tri-state buffer. I'm going to connect OE2, second one, OE3, and OE4 to these guys. Okay, so let's say again, for example, if I were to want to read from any of the eight switches from in this last dip switch package here, the first thing that I would want to do is disable these first three tri-state buffer components by writing a high voltage to the respective OE signals within these components. And how I would go about doing that in our specific setup is by writing a high voltage from port B pin 0, port B pin 1, and port B pin 2. And remember, I can go about doing that by either writing a 1 to the respective bits within the port B underscore out register, or I could write 1 to the same bits with a from within the port B out set register. Now after I disable these first three components, I would want to enable this last tri-state buffer component by writing a low voltage to the OE signal. And how I go about doing that in our setup is by writing a low voltage from port B pin three. And I could again do that by writing a low voltage or a zero to the respective bit in the out register, or I would write a one to the same bit in the out clear register. So two natural follow-up questions that could be asked in regard to this implementation are one, is this implementation better than the previous implementation that we showed in this video? And two, is this implementation the best that we can do? Well, the answer to the first question should be relatively straightforward. Yes, this implementation seems to be better than the first. Why? Because it seems to be more scalable. And what I mean by that is in regard to the number of port bits that we needed within our market controller, or ultimately the number of ports that we needed. So a little bit more formally, let's write that. So in our first example, the number of port bits that we needed was equivalent to the number of switches that we had. So that obviously, this one-to-one -one mapping cannot scale too well when you get to, like we said, 37 or however many large amounts of sets of 8-bit dip switches that we needed. Now in our second example, scaled much more nicely, assuming that we connected eight, each set of 8-bit dip switch packages to a tri-state buffer component and all of those switches shared one single bus, then the number of port bits that we needed 
became eight for each of the bits of the output bus that we connected to a single port. And then we needed an additional amount of port bits to control each of the tri-state buffer components necessary. Now, to generalize that for our specific example, that number would be the number of switches divided by eight, and then the ceiling of that, because we would want a nice clean division to account for however many tri-state buffer components we needed. So as we can tell, the number of signals that we needed for the second example scaled much more nicely than the number of signals needed in the first example. And that ultimately was because we had a constant amount of signals needed for the switches themselves. So that was the answer to the first question. Now the second question, is this the best that we can do? Well, the answer to that question is no, it's not the best that we can do. But how do we go about making it better? Well, it seems like the most luck that we're having in making our implementations better than the previous one is by trying to optimize or minimize the amount of signals needed to connect the microcontroller to the set of external entities that we wish to connect it to. So in the first example, we minimize the number of signals needed to connect the switches down from a variable amount of however many switches were necessary to a constant amount of eight in our specific example. But in doing so, we incurred a non-constant or a variable amount of signals necessary to deal with the tri-state buffer components that we added to our original design. So is there a way to further optimize maybe either this constant value or ideally this non-constant or variable amount of signals? Well, the answer to that is that it depends, but often our current solution or one similar does in fact provide a practical amount of signals. So where does that leave us? Well, although we might have more or less achieved what we initially set out to accomplish, we have only thus far focused on optimizing hardware when attempting to create a scalable solution. Well, how about any software that we would write to control this hardware? Does our current setup allow such software to be written in a scalable manner as well? Recall that in the context of our previous example, just to read from a specific dip switch package, we need to ensure that all other connected devices were disabled before even being able to enable the desired component. More generally, in any setup similar to this one, where any number of external components share a set of signals, to interface with one such component, a programmer of that system would need to be aware of any and all other devices connected to the desired component. This in general is not in any way a scalable method for writing software. Instead, it would be nice if we could somehow have an interface where all control for any set of external hardware was generalized and abstracted away from a programmer while maintaining a practical amount of hardware signals as we've done previously. Well, this type of interface, among other things, is exactly what would be presented in the following video of this lecture, where Wes will take over. Following this, I will return an additional video to demonstrate some more external hardware expansion examples. Until then, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you all later. I hope you liked our video, and if you did, like and subscribe right here. Do it now. I won't look. Well, maybe a little. And if you really liked us, follow us on Twitter right here.